that's in principal research, Microsoft Research India. So uh, to start the session, I, may I request our session chair, Professor Umesh Deshpande, VNIT Nagpur, to please introduce and welcome our next guest. Over to Umesh, sir. Uh, thank you, madam. So the first session was really very interesting and I wonder for all of us to understand what are the challenges that uh, uh, we need to face in order to have computational thinking for visually impaired. So uh, welcome to the second session and uh, all of us know the, the speakers. I just want to you know, thank them again for being with us for the entire day. So uh, Supriya Day, she is the founder of uh, Vision em uh, Empowerment and uh, Dr. Manohar Swaminathan, Principal Research Scientist at, uh, at Microsoft Research. And we had uh, very nice activities which were conducted by Rajeshwari Madam, uh, Devi Madam, as Sylvia Madam uh, showed us a demo of Subodha. And, I'm, and I know that Anshuman is, is there in the background. So all of them are with us and uh, uh, let's, let's proceed with the second session without uh, any, any break. So over to you, Supriya Madam. Thanks a lot. Are you muted, Dashupia? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I had, uh, I think I was. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. So welcome back to the second half of the week workshop. Uh, so I'm sure by now you have a pretty good idea of uh, what WICT is all about and why we even started this intervention. Okay. So I think we also appreciated the fact that inclusive education is not the responsibility of the curriculum creators alone, right? But also of the implementers, is us. Um, and I'm sure, you know, by now you're tired of polls uh, or else I would have asked this question that, you know, what was the most important perspective you gained uh, through the first session? Uh, but then uh, we conduct awareness sessions and, you know, Pragya, we call our training sessions Pragya, training for sighted teachers as well. And the most important takeaway they cite uh, has always been the awareness that these children are equally capable and it uh, requires just a little thought on making the materials and the pedagogy into. So you notice that we followed the same outcome based methods, uh, you know, through indicators and, you know, through the same learning areas of the uh, curriculum, but without the child recognizing it. And of course, uh, for the most of us, seeing is believing. And so, you know, you witnessed some of our play sessions uh, with grades one, two, three across the country. Now let's take a step back and see how we got here. Right. So why, why do we no need to do this? Why do we uh, need to, you know, need, why do I need to tell you how we got here? So the reason is that, that you know, <clears throat> the fact is that we have been able to create a pilot and the play plans to cover the numeracy part of the CT learning areas for grades one to three uh, over the last three years. Uh, this year, we are working on the middle school curriculum. And uh, all of you know that there's lots more to be covered. So I'd like to invite all of you, since you are experts in this field, to join us in this activity and make CT accessible uh, for every child in the country, irrespective of their disability and thereby you know also make the ambitious inclusive education goals of the NEP uh, you know that we have set for ourselves so at the outset even before proceeding i'd like to acknowledge the huge contribution of our mentors at triplity bangalore and microsoft research and for the sustained uh, uh, patience of microsoft to let us even begin you know embark on this research project uh, to explore the possibilities uh, for future interventions now, Vision Empower was working with children and special schools. And since these schools in India are where the majority of children with blindness are huddled away, we work with these schools. We had some insights into the challenges in STEM studies. But as I mentioned uh, to Professor Ramanush, that our biggest challenge when it came to CT was that more than 80% of the teachers in these schools were, that we worked with were themselves blind. So the research question that we needed to address was 
how should the CS Pachala Sikhi curriculum be implemented for children with visual impairment in special schools? This was the specific question which, with which we began our uh, pilot. And for this, we designed uh, experiments and we began with uh, the principles of qualitative research. Uh, so we designed the pilot intervention in three schools. And uh, I must tell you that we were very fortunate to begin uh, with a research team, which comprised of, you know, just the right mix. So we had two postgraduates, both droppers in their fields, who were visually impaired and had been through all the challenges themselves. So they were immersed in it, they knew it. So one of them was the founder of V herself as an inspiration. So we had an expert special educator with a postgraduate degree in teaching visually impaired students from the University of Florida. And we had postgraduates in both education and mathematics who were extremely passionate and are extremely passionate about this research. Uh, the team was led by a, a very able program director um, who had huge experience with turnkey projects in both corporate and in the not-for-profit sectors. Uh, the design framework we used was entirely the brainchild of Dr. Swami Manohar and Dr. Joy Jikpal. And Dr. Manohar has lived with us through all the travails over the last three years from day Z. So despite the ludic approach uh, with the children at school, we had a very systematic, based and uh, milestone-based uh, project exit. Now the entire project was planned to include uh, the stakeholders right into the design process the students, teachers, academic experts, and technologists also, as you can see, all into the design process and in co-creating the big program. The play plans uh, that we created followed a gated process. We had a, we have a vision empowered content management process and we get it reviewed by experts and rework at every stage. And we have enough flexibility for continuous improvement. So this, uh, you know, the play session were specifically designed um, using the principles of the Ludic design for accessibility, which Dr. Manohar will talk about in detail after this. And in this approach, the child is free to explore and even create their own rules in the game and challenge their teammates as you saw them during the game. They were challenging each other, they were making new rules. You know, they were creating a game within the session itself. And, uh, you know, the, this is more what we call a constructivist approach, right? And this initially wasn't easy for us because, you know, as I said, we are products of the old school, right? So it wasn't easy for us to begin with, but it was a, it was a mindset which I think Dr. Manohar grilled into us. And this is where uh, analysis of our detailed observation reports that we collected every day when we went to school or played with the children helped in reworking and redefining the pedagogic process to the entire pilot. So the children, their teachers, the parents, and of course, later after COVID, the parents, and you know, all of these were essentially part of the, uh, what is called a participatory design approach uh, adopted for Project Fit. And over the pilot, we largely focused on face-to-face -face interaction with about 38 across three schools uh, in any um, area in the school, which was not a classroom, right? We conducted these sessions on uh, tactile uh, card games, which as you know, were designed over the year. As we played the games, uh, the card uh, design evolved. So we have now, and this is uh, specifically, it is under the ludic design uh, for accessibility framework and uh, Dr. Manohar will talk, talk to you more about it. And of course the Torino, uh, the Torino, which is uh, currently marketed as the boat jumper, uh, you know, so that provides a tactile programming environment uh, created by Microsoft Cambridge. Uh, so the program went through rigorous research uh, by this joint team. And uh, overall we had in the year one of the pilot, we had 61 sessions from which data was collected. And based on that, now uh, let me share with you quickly uh, some of the analytical uh, discussions uh, based on the empirical results that we uh, collected over the pilot, right? So firstly, we found that it was possible to design accessibility. You know, it, it was nothing impossible. Not only that, there were many of these games were, or, you know, activities were available off the shelf. 
you notice the children uh, enjoying the tactile board games, right? And many of the schools or caregivers, you know, what we found is either they were oblivious, they didn't know, or, uh, you know, they knew and they decided to keep it under lock and key outside the reach of the children. Clearly, that was the finding that, you know, this needed to change if you wanted them to. Secondly, we found that the learning has to be subtle. It has to be a subtle side effect and not an explicit learning game, neither an unhealthy competition. So the games needed to be the departure point and not the lesson in the chapter, right? So basically it had to be motivational enough for the child to enjoy the process, right? So this leads us actually to the importance of creation of a sustainable plan, right? You can't have a, you know, yeah, it's, great to play one day but you know how are you going to do it over and over again over the year like you need to have an implementation plan you need to sustain it. and what should be the duration how much should be the duration so that so that you can have the attention of the child right and how frequent should it be to not lose their uh, interest in it all these things you know we had to come up with by the end of one year so that we could continue with the second year and here one very important finding in during this uh, you know investigation was that in order to scale, uh, we, we had to include the existing teachers. This is the, you know, as an answer to the question with, uh, which Mr. Ramkriti also had, is that we needed to include the existing teachers in the process and not create a, you know, parallel education. So this is uh, one thing which where we, you know, um, brings us to actually the most important finding uh, that, you know, the that there was a dual role that the teacher had to play. So during the game, the teachers were best accepted in throughout our pilot. They were best accepted uh, in the role at best as experienced players, certainly not as teachers. The children wanted to play with playmates, right? So that was a role which the teachers had to mold themselves into. They had to play uh, with the children. And, but at the same time, the teachers themselves had to remain astute observers uh, each moment and accept the failures as well. And, you know, back at the office every day, every single day, the teachers needed to wear their teacher hats and ensure that, you know, the observations were shared with everybody, documented, brainstormed, and then we could arrive at the new play plans uh, to, uh, by learning from each other. So, um, you know, barely had we, uh, you know, conducted, uh, so this we did over the one year, throughout the pilot, we did this. And after a year, when we, you know, had barely conducted one uh, training session with the teachers on VIC, and Dr. Manohar also had conducted one workshop uh, at the Microsoft Accessibility Room in Bangalore on digital literacy for teachers using the ludic approach, uh, when COVID struck and the schools closed. Right. Uh, now, I will not go into what happened due to COVID. I'm sure all of you know. But one thing I'd like to mention is that the uncertainties that was brought about, about by COVID surely spurred us to think in terms of alternative uh, approaches. Right. And here is where the inherent flexibility of the ludic approach and the constructivist paradigm that I mentioned helped us to redefine the pedagogic process. So you all know that education had gone online. But what did we find? We found that, you know, there was a huge gap in digital literacy among these teachers at the schools for the visual impact. And we were engaged uh, with them in different ways, but we didn't have to talk to them over phone or, you know, in the smart class. We didn't have to do all of that. So we realized that we needed to rethink about that. And now we recognize that many of these teachers didn't even have smartphones or connectivity. Forget the students, many of them don't have even now. So even before continuing with VIC, with support from Microsoft researchers, we came up with a digital uh, literacy um, research program and then created uh, digital literacy tutorials in Canada when they have created them. We distributed these to the teachers and supported them over phone calls. 
So finally, we were able to start training sessions online with them somewhere in November 2020. And of course, once we trained them, now they're pros at it. They can get into breakout rooms and out of rooms and, you know, they do wonderful things now, all the visually impaired teachers I'm talking about. And this was a huge learning. And the, the tutorials are now being provided in other regional languages as well. And uh, meanwhile, while this was going on, what we did parallelly was we created the online versions of the games, which we played with. So far, we have about 20 games which can be played online with the children, which you saw the examples of. And uh, some of them are just played over plain phone calls. They don't have the smartphones. So we ju they just borrow a feature phone from an uncle or an aunt and we just uh, play with them over phone calls. And the learning from this exercise, surely many of you who are uh, teachers have been doing many, many such innovative things. And so, you know, let me summarize quickly, uh, uh, you know, what were the uh, main learnings after these uh, enhancements. So what we had to do, yeah, we can go to the next slide, Raji. Uh, we had to move uh, easily to, you know, available materials in rural settings, right? Because we couldn't send any material. So whatever was available at their home or their hut, whatever you want to call it, uh, you know, uh, they needed to use. So we usually use, uh, you know, compensatory techniques, as I told you, you know, for the children during class, there are these hand over hand or hand under hand uh, techniques, uh, basically touch, touch based techniques of teaching. But since this was not possible, so our play plans had to be revisited and we had to enlist support from caregivers. It could be siblings or intermediaries like you know, the uh, parents or uh, somebody else or sometimes special education of the visiting villages. So uh, with this, you know, we had to also revisit the duration and frequency because of the change requirements on infrastructure, you know, the logistics change. And one other very important uh, finding during this period was the lack of uh, early childhood care and education for children with visual impairment uh, before they reach school, right? So because they had not gone to school, they, if, they, if they're not trained on the basic skills, like, you know, fine motor, cross motor, sensory, social skills, or these were the very basic skills. And so it led to the, uh, you know, launch of a new research project so that we could make, make them CT ready in the first place, right? So I'd like to end this by saying that we totally appreciated one more thing in the process is that, and very critical, is that making the CT curriculum accessible does not mean simplifying the CS Pachata syllabus, right? We had to retain the essence of the curriculum and respect the complexity where it belongs, the abstraction, all of it in our plan. And the play plans were created uh, to include sighted and visually impaired persons to play together at the very outset. It was meant to be inclusive at its genesis, right? And the ludic approach, in fact, demonstrates that many of these could be used for children with other disabilities as well. And as we get ready for broader dissemination, I don't think there's any better platform than this CTIS. And we're very, very uh, fortunate to be here today. And the, uh, the esteemed members of the CS Patshala to co-create content for higher grades and share whatever we have created so far with all teachers and children across the country and improve on it together, you know, as a team. So in this context, we are confident that our accessible learning management Subodha will be a great technological catalyst uh, moving forward. With this, I leave you uh, with a glimpse of the numbers we have reached so far. Uh, as you can see, uh, we have uh, created about 45 uh, CG play plans, which can be easily accessed by you. Uh, we have reached indirectly to a large number of students through teachers, more than 3,700. Uh, directly with teachers, we have about 375 teachers now across the country. We began with one state, Karnataka, uh, three schools, then 10 schools. And then this year, actually the third year, we were to do 30 schools and uh, as many teachers. Uh, however, uh, you know, because of the online mode and uh, easily being able to reach out to others who also are looking for support. We have uh, so far actually already uh, touched uh, about uh, 83 schools. So 
with this uh, i now uh, thank all of you and i'd like to hand over to dr manohar for his uh, session thank you so much uh, thanks supriya uh, i think uh... You have reduced the number of uh, things that I have to speak about uh, very, very clearly and nicely. Thank you so much. So I'm going to spend uh, maybe about 30 minutes um, looking at what this ludic design for accessibility is, specifically in the context of uh, computational thinking. Raji, should we please go ahead? Um, so um, just a brief background. You can just skip through the next two slides. Um, currently, the design for accessibility for people with disabilities is basically creating solutions that improve lives of people um, go forward please next two slides you can go um, essentially um, most of the approach is to say that how can i improve the livelihood the, the uh, education the employment skills so it's a very utilitarian focus approach for accessibility but most of the time what happens is people forget that people with disabilities are people uh, they love and leisure entertainment and play with just like anybody else. And so the primary motivation, uh, next slide, for um, ludic design is that we play because we are human and we are human because we play. Uh, so there was a poll earlier, right, about what you cannot live without. Suppose I were to add play, your favorite play, into it. I can pretty much confidently say that most of you will pick that. Especially in the COVID time, one of the things I'm sure all of us missed was just getting out outdoors or indoors or with other people playing and enjoying uh, whatever that game may be. Uh, so play is so, so critical to our existence. As human beings, we are unique in the ability to play. And we take out play, unfortunately, in our schools, especially. We say, oh, don't waste your time. Don't play. What is it? You're not going to get marks if you play. I think that's what we want to change. We want to say play. Play all the time, but you'll also learn. Let's see how we can uh, in the next few slides. So our ludic design for accessibility primarily is based on the premise that play and playfulness are central to what makes us human. And so we need to keep that focus. So we cannot separate playfulness uh, from the design experience. And if we do so, we in fail the intended users of whatever we are designing. So that's the basic idea behind uh, the research uh, ludic design. Our next slide. So I'm pretty sure I, I've enjoyed, I remember playing with the tire, trying to keep it up and running along with it on all kinds of roads and streets and play never stops. Uh, on the right, you have some older women playing um, your game, every favorite game. That's when we are fully alive. And uh, so play, play center, uh, next one. So uh, looting design, if we want to put a simple equation, it is pure play. Pure play has lots of um, um, parameters to it. Uh, it is voluntary. Nobody can say, hey, you go play for 15 minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to punish you. That's not play. Uh, you play because every player wants to play. There are simple rules, whatever may be complex rules, but all the players agree on the rules yes. of the game. Sorry to interrupt, Manohar. I think there is a, uh, we're not able to hear you. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so maybe now. Your voice is breaking. Battery. Is it better now? Hello? Can you hear me? Uh, I think it's better. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker as well. Um, is, so you can, can you hear me better now? Start now uh, it was just scratchy. We could hear you, but it was very scratchy. scratchy. So um, go ahead. You can go ahead now. It's much better now, Dr. Manan. You can go okay. ahead. I've gotten rid of my headphone, so I think it should be okay. Okay. So um, what I was saying is ludic design as a simple equation is pure play. Pure play itself has uh, many characteristics. One is, as I mentioned, uh, it is voluntary. People play because they want to play. People, children, adults, whoever it is, you cannot force them to do an activity and call it play. And play has no obvious benefits. You cannot make money. And anytime you play something to make money, that's no longer play. That's a business, that is uh, employment. Um, and the rules of the game are all agreed to by the players of the game. They can change it, but every player in the game has to agree to that game. Only then it's important and interesting. So the example is all the street cricket, right? 
uh, we the you you must just say that that stone is the wicket and everybody agrees uh, you cannot say where are the three stakes where are the, no the team everybody who is playing agrees that that stone is the wicket and if the ball hits it you're out and if you hit the neighbor's compound you're out don't ask me why that's the rule so play is that flexible the players have to agree and with that agreement in a limited time and space you enjoy it so this is pure play there's lots of uh, literature on what play is i will not go into all of that but keeping this all of us know what pure enjoyable play is let's keep that as the major component what we do as a ludic designer is to throw in a designed side effect um, so i want to um, get the players gain some benefit by playing by playing a lot and enjoying the play but the skill or that outcome happens as a side effect not as the primary thing you are not playing because you want to get that you are playing because you want to play and you play for an extended period those skills become yours that's the uh, basic uh, what should i say description of ludic design for accessibility and i'm sure you would have seen from the examples in the earlier session about how the children are having a great time they are playing some games but all of you also agreed that they are picking up skills in numeracy uh, systematic counting uh, associating numbers with the quantity etc cetera, etc cetera. so this is essentially uh, what ludic design is let's go ahead and uh, again there's a huge uh, literature on how play is so critical for cognition and education um, i will not go into the details but uh, it's not as if we suddenly said play is important for education people have been saying it for years and years unfortunately our standard school system has become so hard bound and against play that we find that uh, we need to go back to the basics of why play is central to education and learning uh, next slide so we come to the specific uh, application of ludic design um, for accessibility in the wic project and this is also the first uh, effort in actually putting this quote theory into practice and uh, the last hour you got a glimpse of uh, where we have been able to go with this methodology because of the fantastic effort of the team uh, at vision empower uh, let's go to the next slide uh, similarly there's lots of evidence on how well designed board and card games can lead to measurable improvements in numeracy many literature exists on how this is important and useful and um, most of the work is unfortunately limited to sighted children in high resource areas not in um, in areas like uh, schools in rural areas in india um, and also for uh, not for children with any kind of impairments so our project uh, the big project is essentially to design prototype and contextually evaluate appropriate games that can be applied to visually impaired children in india to improve their numeracy next slide and so as teachers educators academics uh, this will be the biggest question is it all play and no work um, you know it's all fun you can get children to play and they will play forever but uh, how do we uh, ensure that they are actually we are actually covering the curriculum and how do we know that uh, they are actually learning stuff i mean we cannot uh, abdicate our responsibility as teachers uh just because play is important and it is wonderful and joyful so i'll spend some time on uh, our thoughts on how uh, we intend to cover the curriculum first and then how to assess the learning our next slide so what we have done um is um look at uh, numeracy the early grades 1 to 3 the computational thinking curriculum relating to numeracy we have created a matrix um so the the rows are for grades and the columns are key learning indicators uh, in numeracy and these indicators we have picked up from the existing literature on foundations of numeracy there are many people across you know 100 i mean tens of years or decades of research on what is numeracy what are the number skills and classifying them into learning areas i've listed many of them here number recognition measurement positioning and locating and so on and so forth and we also have a broad set of understanding on at each grade level what kind of learning areas do we cover and for each of these areas 
what level of complexity that we go in each grade. So number recognition will be there in grade one and uh, grade two, you may increase the complexity. Simple arithmetic, you may not even start till later in grade one, but in grade two, it will be more uh, involved arithmetic. So all of you as teachers understand this. So the basic matrix that you are building up is to take the existing specification on what curriculum is appropriate for what grade in fine detail. Um, so next slide. So if you just pick one uh, area, number pattern, there are many subcategories. And what I've highlighted is the number patterns you will do a little bit in grade one, a little bit more complex in grade two and grade three and so on, right? So every colored uh, dot here has a learning area and sub areas which are appropriate for a certain grade level. So this matrix is the end goal of uh, our curriculum. You say computational thinking, you can then break it into several um, subcategories of learning indicators. And then we could also as educators assign these uh, learning indicators in some order of complexity and assign them to various grades. So this matrix is the outcome that we are looking for. Children have to, at a certain grade level, be able to master the skills that are indicated that are appropriate for that grade level. So this is the outcome that we're looking for. So the question is, how are you going to reach this outcome? Uh, next slide. So let's uh, take an example card game, uh, Rummy. Okay. Um, this I hope most of you are familiar with. This is a 13 card game, which is uh, widely popular in India, especially. And unfortunately, uh, it has a bad connotation of gambling, which I think we need to uh, erase and uh, look at the complexity of uh, skills that can be learned by playing this game. So what I've shown here on the bottom is a matrix of key learning indicators that can be picked up if you play the game Rummy. Um, and at what grade levels are these um, skills indicator. So the green uh, markers say the game of Rami covers these learning indicators across these three grades. How do we do this? If you play the game, if you know the game, uh, you can say, for example, it has to know, you have to know ordering of numbers. You need to know how to sort numbers. You need to find missing or uh, you need to know patterns. Um, so you can, and you need to eventually, when you finish a game, you have to add to get your point. So if you analyze this game, you will clearly be able to find out. Of course, it's not by one person, one or two people look at it and you analyze, okay, which skill do you, it also involves at some point strategy. You can also talk about probability. So you have three sixes, you want to make the fourth six and you need to say, should I wait or not? And you also need to be memorizing, being aware of whether somebody has discarded a six. So there are so many skills that are there that we need to analyze it and capture what are the learning indicators that are covered if I know how to play this game very well. Okay, uh, next slide. Uh, just to uh, say that I'm not just preaching to the choir, this is a picture of maybe 50 years old. Uh, I am second from left, uh, probably about between four and five years of age, playing with my brothers and cousins, right? You can see the intense concentration that is there. Nobody told us we would go play for one hour. We would just play at every opportunity in our get together. And I don't know what the game that is being played is, but we have been playing card games uh, forever. And uh, Rami is also an important game there. Are, but we, we uh, thrive in finding new games, we play. And I realized that um, subtly um, there's so much of, um, skills that get built up by playing this game. So I just wanted to uh, say that I'm not preaching something and doing something else. Uh, I, uh, I'm actually trying to convert people into playing a lot more. Uh, next slide, please. So what we did is for each of the games um, that we have now, we have created, we have just indicated what are the learning indicators that these games cover. And this, as you can see, is a growing list. And I'm hoping that many of you will help us grow this list further. Pick your favorite game and we can um, see what kind of KLIs that game covers. And if you take the union of all these games, 
um, you see the bottom um, larger matrix. These gains that are indicated here cover all the green dots from grade one to three. There are some gaps, as you can see, which means we need to create more games that will fill those gaps. But for those which have a green dot, it's possible that more than one game is covering that skill, which is obviously how it is. If you recall the market game um, example that in the earlier session, and when you were asked what learning indicators were covered in a different way, right? You said patterns, this, 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 money. So four or five things get covered in every game. That is the nature of games. It is not unlike our traditional learning process where you do addition and it's just addition, 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 addition without any context. A game involves many things together. That's what makes it fun and engaging. But the point is, if I have this set of games, I know that if the child can play all of these games, these skills that are indicated in green are covered, okay? So this quest is to find more and more games, to cover the gaps, one, two, to provide options for children. I may like a card game, but I may, somebody else may not like card games, but you cannot say if you don't play cards, you are out of the school. Uh, I need a multiplicity of games, just for variety. We love variety. Uh, all of us love variety. And we have different uh, capabilities to absorb material in different ways. So different games are appropriate for different children. So our quest is to create a rich set of games at the same time, ensuring our original question, how is the curriculum covered? We need to do the systematic work of understanding each game, analyzing what skills are part of this game and collate a whole a growing set of games that we offer on a platform like Suboda for teachers everywhere to borrow, add, play, and enrich their children. Let's go to the next one. So this is a basic question. How do we create new games and play for computational thinking? So I say start by looking at games that you love to play first. Uh, the key part, as uh, Supriya mentioned in closing, is that teachers have to love playing. And if you don't play any games, I warn you that, you know, you better go start playing. You're missing out. So you start playing, pick a game that you enjoy most. And obviously uh, it has to have some connotation and context to uh, computational thinking, but you'll be surprised. Many games uh, you will find have context in computational thinking because computational thinking, as we all know, covers a whole set of things and uh, algorithms. If you just pick algorithms, so many activities in everyday life, including play and games, can be used um, systematically. So you need to um, pick a game that you love, find something that has CT-related content. As I mentioned, most things will have some things. Identify the KLIs. That's where you need to, it becomes, it's no more hand-waving. You need to be specific about the curriculum context, the specific learning, uh, which is codified by all the experts in this area and say which of these can be uh, enhanced by playing this game. Obviously you play with few children and adults and if it's new to some children or adults, you explain the game as you play. Um, and first of all, see if you enjoy it, see if the children are enjoying it. And if you can tweak the game, that's the nature of play. Uh, the players can treat the game to make it more enjoyable, play and repeat. And if it is enjoyable, and you have already done the homework of saying, if this game is played, these skills will be acquired as a side effect. Then you're all set. You create a play plan, share it to others, let lots of more people play. They will improve it. They will tell you what works, what does not work, and you iterate. Now, that's how we create a new play plan goes into the open resource through Suboda, everybody plays. And we are hoping one of the reasons we got very excited about this is with so many excited, passionate teachers, um, if they apply this methodology to the diverse context they all live and play in, uh, we will have the you know very enriched set of games uh, in uh, computational thinking and be available to everyone. Uh, next slide. So this is again a um, major question, right? Uh, how do we assess? Um, so the standard um, way of assessing is unfortunately the bane of Indian education, right? The testing. Testing kills learning, in my view. 
Um, as soon as you say, I'm going to test whether it is adult or children, you freeze and your natural capabilities are completely swamped by the anxiety about, oh, I'm going to be looking like a stupid, I'm an idiot and my rank is going to be worse. And so all of these are unfortunately part of our education system and we are not out there to uh, change the system at one shot. But our hope is play makes assessment also fun and joy. Uh, how is that? So if I um, take the same Rummy example, right? So you know this game improves certain KLIs. That's all well known. Uh, so I want to assess a bunch of children whether they have these skill sets. What's more simple than to play a game of Rummy with these children? Obviously, they would have must have played it before because you cannot suddenly say, well, let's play Rummy and I will evaluate you. If they have played Rummy, you play a game one round, two rounds, and children play and uh, they beat you hollow or you beat them hollow, does not matter who wins. But uh, when you know that they are playing the game as per the rules for Rummy and they're enjoying it, it's clear that they have already picked up all of the skills. You don't need an arithmetic test. You don't need sorting test in this range that Rummy calls for. Um, all of them are implicitly exhibited by the fact of playing. And examination then becomes playing and it does not need an examiner. Uh, anybody who knows Rami can be called in to play with the children. And at the end of it, you say, okay, which child knows the rules, which child, uh, how many, you know, what happened. And that's all you need to assess this child for those KLIs. But again, obviously I'm simplifying uh, this very, very complex part of assessment, which requires so many areas across this curriculum and so on. But the core of the idea is that we need to make play itself part of the assessment process. Um, so this is uh, something which um, as you play, and I'm sure as you think about these games um, and play, when you go back, you'll realize that, uh, especially when you create your own game and a play plan, uh, you will come up with the idea as to what skills and how do I assess. So in our play plan, we have a, uh, separate um, aspect uh, when we uh, look at assessment, um, it need not be a one-shot assessment, which is again a problem with our current testing, right? You do about three months, then they have a test or one month there's a test. Because of games providing multiple skills at the same time at different levels, um, children pick up these skills as they play and different children will pick up different skills from different games at different rates. They are all heterogeneous, our children. Every one of us is unique. And these games, with the multiplicity of games that are available, this assessment happens around the year. Uh, as you play more and more games, all you need to know is each child, what games can the child play, has played. And you just look at all the games that the child is competent in. And you can do the assessment independently of bringing the child over to demonstrate the gameplay. So like your attendance record, all you need to do is what are the games you played? And, uh, you know, you just have to say who won, who, who scored how many points in this game. And if you have a record of all of this for all the games that have been played, um, you can offline look at it and compare the metrics of the learning indicators and do a checklist of which child needs to improve, uh, which KLI, which is missing and so on and so forth. So this is another ongoing research that we are evolving because you've only been here two years plus in, in a reasonable way and we have covered a very small part of the CP syllabus and we are starting to implement it in schools as part of their curriculum and schedule. And of course, one and a half years, we have not been able to put it into practice in actual schools on a daily basis. Once we do this, we will get and learn a lot more about assessment and uh, we will be uh, sharing all of this with all of you. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so that's essentially the skill. Um, um, yeah, next, uh, you can go back. Uh, yeah, so I just want to just summarize some of the key aspects of LDA. Joyful play is the most important. If either the child or you, that's also important. It's not just the uh, children who should enjoy it. If the teacher is not enjoying it, there's something wrong. Uh, because like what Cipria mentioned earlier, the teachers have to become co-players. And for a play to be enjoyable, everyone should enjoy. 
Um, and so if enjoyment is not there, you have to, you have the flexibility to say, hey, how can we change the rules of the game to make it more enjoyable in our context for this team? Um, and we have to become children again and play. And I'm pretty sure all of you play in different contexts and you are alive when you are playing. And all we are suggesting is bring that joy into your job, which is teaching. And of course, uh, I've been a teacher for a long, long time. And that's one of the most rewarding professions. And I'm also sure that most teachers, the worst time or the worst aspect of teaching is grading. At some point, you have to mark some number and send it across as a record on the child's uh, mark sheet. And that's really, you know that the child is better, but based on the instrument of a test that you have been asked to evaluate, the child only gets this. But you know, this child is so good, but she's not doing as well as shown in her. So we as teachers really um, take a lot of, um, we put ourselves in when we actually grade these children. And that's the toughest part of being a teacher. But I am hoping that when we bring in more and more of play and take away this uh, drudgery and torture of evaluation and grading in the traditional sense, all of us will be uh, benefited by that uh, change. Uh, of course, be open to rules proposed by the children. Uh, play along, you will find new ideas. I mean, this is really um, how most of our games also evolve because uh, when we try a new game, we play with the children and then we find out oh, this doesn't work and somebody will, some child will say, let's do this, we try and then it works and we, um, you know, adapt it as uh, our uh, rule for this play. And especially on the online context, this is very, very important. Um, we need to um, innovate um, uh, on the fly, um, to make things work in a remote way where five children are in different locations in different phones, different uh, orientations and different uh, skill levels and using the phones, but all of our sessions have been so enjoyable. Like some of the examples you saw, uh, this is not um, cherry picked examples. Every session is uh, so enjoyable that we could have given you a two hour uh, video clipsing of uh, all of those things uh, that have been going on, right? So lastly, uh, remember pure play, everyone plays because they want to play and not because they're forced to play. So this is very important. Uh, I think this is probably my last slide. Let's go to the next one. Yeah, but of course, uh, all of these are um, very optimistic, uh, joyful views, but there are many, many uh, challenges, like I mentioned, very different from classroom teaching uh, and play sessions are not the same as class hours. Um, so it cannot be compartmentalized and you um, uh, cannot have, um, so the difficult challenge is how do we integrate this in a regular school structure? Obviously, I think, again, um, in this context of CT, uh, we have an advantage because I think most schools are still doing CT, in, if I'm correct, um, outside the main curriculum because main curricula is not caught up um, as a basic requirement in every grade yet across all states. So you are already doing this, enjoying this, and children, I'm sure, are enjoying it because it's not part of their main curriculum. So the challenge is how to integrate it with the school curriculum and the schedule. And one of the things I want to emphasize again is that um, teachers and parents have to become children again. Uh, curious, unafraid, uh, making an effort of making mistakes and exploring all the time. Uh, we are not know-it-alls. Um, we are also children at heart and we need to explore, take risks. More important, we get uh, kind of focused on, oh, we are playing for 45 minutes we better make sure these children pick up the skills. We are so committed to transferring knowledge that we become, quote, teachers say, oh, you should do this. You should cover this because otherwise what's going to happen? You may not. So take out all the stress um, and stay away. It takes a lot of effort to stay away from giving instructions. Oh, you are doing wrong. No, 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 don't do, don't, don't do, don't do it. No, no, you just step back and let the child and the other players evolve, they will learn. And the best way to think about it is, suppose there's a new board game that somebody has introduced, bought from the market and say, oh, this is a fantastic game, come and play. How do you play? You go in, the person who has played it before says, uh, I'll explain some basic rules, but let's start playing and I'll tell you as we go along. Otherwise it becomes a long instruction set. So 
they will give you some basic thing roll this die do this i'll tell you what's going on you join you roll the die and they will do this and they will simplify it the first game will be not for real you know you'll play for you know i'll teach you but we'll just play for uh, you know fake game so you go through the moves and twice thrice you say oh idea i'm going to play now let's play the real you play you lose badly but next time you play you get better four games later you are beating the other person this is really the sense of how we should quote teach a game um, teachers are experienced players who are introducing other players to the game slowly and as you introduce you can let back and other children who have learned the game will teach the other children so peer learning which is like a big buzzword in education happens automatically in when you play games so please remember play is central and of course we really really need all of your contributions in extending the collection of games and play to cover this huge set of things that are part of what we call as computational thinking so that's basically what i have i think uh, next slide is it my last slide yes okay so thank you and uh, we will um, have a separate q and a session uh, after this uh, what is the thing shukriya uh, yes dr manohar so um, we can have a q and a if we have time but i think we are almost done so yeah. I, I don't know but there are some questions and answers but maybe before that uh, we can just listen to vidya sure please go ahead and then uh, we can open up for q and a yeah ranji hello teachers i'm vidya the founder of vision empower and i'm glad to be talking at this conference today and the work we do at vision empower to make stem education accessible means a lot to me because as a child i always dreamt of such accessible resources especially when i had to study subjects such as math and science and guess what i'm visually impaired but i really loved math technology and science related subjects and unfortunately all of these were completely visual despite several people telling me to drop these subjects i continued these subjects till my post graduate level just because i loved these subjects for sure there was nothing wrong with my brain and i could do everything that my sighted friends did like trigonometry calculus and what not i'm sure all of you know that once conceptual knowledge is developed you really don't need eyesight to study or pursue careers related to computational thinking and who wouldn't want to be a part of rewarding stem careers especially when technology is the future and also why should so many visually impaired people be left out from all these opportunities you would be surprised to know that among millions and millions of visually impaired people in india only less than 50 students are studying stem related courses beyond high school and this is largely because of the inaccessible education system and that's where we need all of your support to start thinking in these lines to make your classrooms inclusive and accessible and henceforth consider the needs of visually impaired students while designing anything new because at the beginning it's very easy to make anything accessible but what about everything that has been made inaccessible so far that's also where we need help from all the incredible teachers over here and we have announced a challenge for this very reason we are celebrating our fourth foundation day on 4th of october 2021 and i'll describe a little bit about the challenge you are able to see three areas where we need help on the slide this is also available on our website www.visionempowertrust.org and will also be available on the chat what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to make play plans for one or all of these concepts the play plans have been already demonstrated earlier you can take the learnings from this conference and make accessible play plans and since this is a challenge there will also be prizes you can send 
your entries on or before 3rd October because our foundation day is on 4th October. And since this is a challenge, there's surely prizes for your entries. The best of the best will be rewarded. And if you have any queries, you can also write to the email ID that is given on the slide. Let us all be a part of making computational thinking accessible to every child and support each and every child in achieving their dream and realizing their full potential. I think that brings an end with us. Uh, so this is the challenge. So basically, uh, this is uh, this is a call uh, for all the teachers who are attending here. Uh, you know, you are already creating activities and you already have many activities. And some of these are the ones mentioned here. These are puzzles and, uh, you know, these are games which are already used in uh, CS Patshala curriculum. It would be wonderful for uh, us to have play plans uh, for these. And I'm sure those of you who have created play plans can look into those and see how you can make those accessible. If you really need any support, you can reach out to us uh, on the email ID uh, provided uh, on the screen, visionempowertrust at gmail.com, very simple. And yeah, if you can send it to us, then on the uh, fourth, there would be some awards and we can take this forward in any case. So very glad to be. Uh, here to announce this challenge. Thank you so much. Uh, and I think Dr. Manohar, there are some uh, questions on yeah. the uh, Q&A, maybe Dr. Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Supriya and uh, uh, Dr. Manohar Swaminathan for the excellent lecture. And Vidya's little speech was really inspiring and motivation for all of us. So uh, there are a few uh, questions. First is from Shweta, uh, who uh, is interested in uh, or who has designed some games on Scratch and uh, she would want feedback from, uh, from, from all of you regarding the games that, that she has created. And she says that she also creates games with some stories, uh, story at the background. So she is asking whether uh, these can also be th thought of as skills under uh, this pedagogy. Um. I will um, I request Supriya to talk about the storytelling that has evolved as a powerful tool. Uh, Supriya, can you go ahead? Yeah, you want me to do that first? Or yes, please. You... Yeah, okay. first that and then come back to Scratch afterwards. Okay, okay. So, yes, uh, uh, yeah, very interesting because stories uh, do mean a lot to children when they grow up. And this is something we discovered during our pilot as well. So uh, one of the things that we uh, did was we actually uh, conducted uh, storytelling sessions. So as you, you know, you know, those of you who, who know Jodo can also know that they have, you know, they begin with the story on everything. Similarly, there are many other organizations which focus on stories as a means to learn. But what we found is that not all stories and the way the stories are um, either written or told may not always be uh, very suitable for the child with visual impairment because there, many things are out of context. So we ran an experiment over the pandemic itself. So where we created, uh, you know, a team to work with uh, children with visual impairment, and uh, over a period of almost three months, we uh, we we you know began with telling them story, reading stories, and then later we figured. So this was a fully you know very systematic research we did. End of which we actually found that uh, you need to you need to take up stories but then when you when you use stories as a backdrop to learning we need to keep in mind uh, the mechanism with which the story has to be used and therefore uh, we have incorporated and we are thinking of incorporating it uh, in a larger way into our city games as well so yes that is uh, one of the areas yeah, thanks, Supriya. So uh, as far as Scratch, uh, obviously, um, it's a visual programming language. It's very powerful, very good early learning tool of programming concepts and so on. So what, what I would suggest is um, use this tool um, to get um, ideas about um, key learning areas. Then you could go to explore what kind of tangible artifacts can be used 
to replace the uh, construct that you use in Scratch. At the one end is, of course, what um, was mentioned earlier, this code jumper, which is the tangible programming environment, was kind of um, inspired by Scratch-like programming languages, but converted into uh, pods. So there are statement pods, there are loop pods, you connect them by wire. So whatever you see on a Scratch-like simple thing is actually by, made by connecting um, pods, and then they are electronics and audio outputs and so on. So that's a tangible programming environment. Currently, it's a little expensive. We're trying to figure out how to make it available uh, in India. But to your specific question, Scratch can be a trigger for creating interesting uh, games uh, that uh, can convey specific concepts in computational thinking. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Dr. Manohar and uh, Supriya for the answer. Uh, there are a couple of questions from an anonymous uh, attendee. I will uh, take the second one before the first one. So the second question is, is there a difference between play and a game? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very interesting, very, uh, it's a profound concept actually. Uh, it's not easy to explain, but my understanding, each one's understanding is slightly different. Play, um, so the one which I showed the picture of, uh, just running a tire with a stick, right? That's play. Uh, uh, you just do it because you have, you just enjoy it, right? I mean, the ground may be hard, you may be barefoot, uh, it may fall 17 times and you have to pick it up, but you just do it because just for the joy of it. So play, I would say, is less structured game. The more and more rules you put in, it becomes game. Uh, but game is also play. Uh, but play need not have so many rules. That's my distinction between these two. But it's, it's, it's not the final answer. It's my view of what a play is, what game is. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks for the answer. Now, let me take the first one. And this is about assessment. So, uh, the, the attendee is asking that, uh, should the assessment be based on strategy or just to uh, if, just to be able to play the game? And, uh, yeah. yeah. And I, 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 this is, again, a very important question. So, when we play a game, any of your favorite game, you keep playing it, even though you may be losing every one of the games. Because the fun of a game is in playing, not in winning and losing, so long as you don't put a huge pot of money for winning. Then it becomes, it stops being a game. It is gambling or, you know, com competing for a reward. Play by itself places no real value on winning and losing except to induce you to play more, right? But fail and pass, oh God, that's the word I don't want to listen to, right? Uh, the card that we used to get, postcard when we were in school, so end of summer, you wait for this postcard, which will have a red stamp or a green stamp or something like that. Pass, fail. Uh, that's like tension. So pass, fail is bad. Winning, losing is good uh, because that keeps you engaged in the play. And so when you talk about assessment, obviously, if you start saying, if you win the game, you pass. If you lose the game, you fail. Gone case. I mean, there's no way play is going to be part of our <laughs> education. So... The idea is whether a child can play a game. And when I say assessment, you play, you will play five rounds. You will say who won, who lost as part of the understanding of the game. And whether people are able to play or win or lose, whether they are able to play is what the assessment is based on. And when the question about strategy, if your learning objective is about strategy, then you will worry, you will then analyze the strategy. Uh, so when, um, suppose you want to talk about probability, I have, we haven't done that, I'm just uh, talking on top of my hat. Um, you need to estimate the likelihood that you'll get a three clubs uh, before holding on to two and four in rummy, right? Uh, and then you may say, I'll reshuffle, I'll do something else and I will do this. That requires, strategy is a harder con concept. To evaluate it, you need a lot more, right? So you need to be watching the child play and so I don't know how to do that, but strategy can be, and it's an open thing that, how do we uh, assess strategy? What kind of games by playing repeatedly, you can estimate the strategic thinking of a player? I, I don't have an answer, but that's a very important question that we should ask. Yeah, th thanks Dr. Manohar. Uh, there is another uh, follow-up by, I, I, I think the same, uh, same attendee that, uh, uh, he's kind. Uh, he or she is kind of designing a teacher learning manual for uh, people with have uh, who have uh, you know sight impairment, and mm -hmm. it, uh, which is helpful to practice multiplications and 
So uh, maybe uh, it, the, the attendee can connect offline for a feedback on, on, yes. on, on that. I think that's a good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think we are uh, at the end of the session. And uh, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Manohar and uh, Supriya and the entire team of uh, Rajeshwari Madam, Devi Madam, Sylvia Madam, and Anshuman Nagarwal for the, the great, uh, you know, two and a half hours that we have spent and uh, you know we we are we, it was great learning for all of us and great to know that uh, computational thinking without uh, uh, you know the curriculum which has been designed by cs patshala without diluting any of it how it could be adapted for uh, teaching those skills to visually impaired uh, okay. and thanks a lot and i hand it back to uh, 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 so we come to the end of today's workshop session.